Pass. All right, hello. Uh, I think we're recording and uh, can get started. So uh, welcome to the State Water Resources Control Board for what is our uh, 12th Storms Seminar Series. Um, for those in the room, uh, emergency exits are out the back, down the stairs, and we meet across the street at Cesar Chavez. Uh, bathrooms are out the door to your left. If you hit the closed doors, uh, you went too far. Uh, this presentation is being recorded uh, and will be online uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, and for those that are watching in, please email uh, storms storms at waterboards.ca.gov with any questions. Uh, and with that, uh, this storm seminar series is an open forum to feature new research, technologies, policies, and news relating to stormwater. 
Uh, it's an effort stemming from the State Water Board's strategy to optimize resource management of stormwater and supports our mission of advancing the perspective that stormwater is a valuable resource. Today we are talking trash with Chris Brocate, uh, and here to introduce him is Sean Bothwell of the Coastkeeper Alliance. Thanks, Matt. Uh, my name is Sean Bothwell. I'm the Policy Director for California Coastkeeper Alliance. Uh, we represent the California water keepers here in Sacramento on statewide issues, uh, mostly at the State Water Board on stormwater policies and permits. Um, and I wanted to introduce Chris today to give a little context of, of the importance to us of, for this presentation. Um, back in 2011, California Coastkeeper Alliance was on the public advisory group for the trash policy. Uh, we worked on the trash policy very closely uh, with stakeholders in the State Water Board for five years. It was adopted in 2015. Um, many people don't know that in earlier iterations of the trash policy, um, there was going to be a special program that, that I, I call um, a trash hotspot program. And it might not be what someone would normally think maybe of a, a trash hotspot. Um, most people associate a trash hotspot with maybe like a school or you know, your local Starbucks that's creating a lot of trash in a, maybe an urban area. Um, to us, the way I define a trash hotspot is an area that generates a lot of trash that's outside of the MS4 um, stormwater system and that's not part of the trash policy. So to give some examples, um, homeless encampments, high use beaches and regional parks um, along waterways are largely the three best examples of, of what I think of as a trash hotspot. And that, that type of idea and program of regional boards working on these non-point source issues um, got pulled out of the trash policy uh, because we thought that the policy itself was a lot to implement that we should really focus on the MS4s. Um, and, and the water keepers completely agreed with that. You know, we supported that, that vision. Um, but at the same time, our water keepers on the ground saw the importance of addressing trash hotspots um, throughout California. You know, the local water keepers are on the ground, they see what's going on, they see the impacts to their waterways. And, you know, they thought, fine, MS4's uh, regulation is great, but there's these large amounts of trash that are um, discharging directly into our waterways that need to be addressed as well. And so I thought this uh, presentation was important. Um, our Russian river keeper, has been working with Chris for quite a while now on this program. I think it's uh, really innovative. Um, it, it brings in social components to dealing with homeless encampments on our waterways uh, while also addressing the trash pollution that's going in our waterways. And we're seeing dramatic uh, reductions of trash pollution because of this program. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce Chris Brocate. Uh, he's with the Clean Water Alliance. That's a fiscally sponsored by the Russian Riverkeeper. And I'll let him take over. I got this. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Brocate. I'm with Clean River Alliance and founder and director. Our mission is to remove trash from the Russian River watershed, educate our public, and to create more uh, cleanup events. Uh, we're fiscally sponsored in a project of Russian Riverkeeper, and I want to thank Don McEnhill for all of his support. Up until January, we were an all volunteer based grassroots group. And without his support, we wouldn't have been able to get any of this stuff done. We've been able to create other partners in our community, like working with the City of Santa Rosa Creek Stewardship Program, the County of Sonoma, Surf Rider, and Stewards of the Coast, just to name a few. We also work with local wineries to get together, uh, like Jackson Family Wines, to uh, coordinate big, large uh, work days for them to go out and clean up hot spots that we've uh, identified in our community. Um, we also go and educate our local schools about uh, our watershed and storm drains and provide them with the little placards that we go around and um, actually uh, apply those placards to their campuses and teach them about storm drains and how they flow to our creeks and such. Um, we also, uh, some of the programs that we've started since starting Clean River Alliance is we do, we've done town cleanups where we actually go around and clean up our towns, sweep up our streets. We do monthly beach cleanups on the coast. We do uh, two different sections of adopt a highway in Sonoma County that are uh, parallel the Russian River. So keeping trash off the banks of the, uh, the river along the highways is important to us. We do river-based uh, uh, cleanups by canoe. And we also got involved uh, with the recent fires by mitigating some of the, the runoff from toxic uh, debris and such from properties. Uh, but what makes us different probably than any other group in the United States is 
We've actually engaged our homeless and are working with them uh, and giving them a chance to get rid of trash. And we've provided them with a trash service, which we're here to talk about today. And all of this, we've never been able to do all of this without our amazing volunteers. They've coined a, a name for us. They call us the Garbage Patch Kids. And it's uh, a, 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 a something that uh, has caught on, and some of us actually have uh, Garbage Patch names to go along with it. Uh, we've been recognized recently by our uh, Board of Supervisors with um, a resolution 2016, and recently uh, acquired some funding uh, to uh, create uh, actually full-time position for myself starting January. Up until January, we've been able to do this <clears throat> at an all-volunteer uh, base grassroots uh, group with little or no funding until January. 2016, we were also recognized by our regional water board in our area for the work we've been doing. And last year, we helped remove over 165,000 pounds of trash from the uh, Russian River watershed. It was on this day in uh, 2015 that I decided to start Clean River Alliance after seeing uh, a lot of the debris that was uh, ending up on our beaches outside of the mouth of the Russian River. And what made me angry about this picture is we had just had a beach cleanup about three weeks prior to another water event that brought down all this trash again. And there was nobody to, to organize a cleanup because most of the groups in our community have very little time to organize, but maybe one or two cleanups a year. So uh, so we started going out on the river, doing local cleanups with some friends, going out on the river. The shot here with the drift boat was actually a two mile section of river in the lower river. We filled up in about three hours with 12 volunteers. And we started going out in canoes and retrieving trash. And one of the things I started to notice was that a lot of this trash was coming from homeless encampments. So we started to engage some of the homeless encampments we were going into. Here's one of the camps that was uh, basically 20 yards from the edge of the river. My back's actually to the river, so I'm facing the camp. But about less than 20 yards behind me is actually the bank of the river. So we started to go around some of the camps. Uh, prior to some of these organized cleanup events we had and, and would uh, leave them trash bags and ask them if, you know, we left them bags if we came back in a week during our cleanup, uh, if they would stage the trash for us. And we were finding a lot of situations like this. The one on the left there is uh, uh, right under Highway 116, not far from uh, the Russian River. So we started uh, leaving bags for them, and lo and behold, we'd show up the day of our cleanup, and we'd find all this trash stage for us. And typically, they would have two questions. One was, can we get more bags, and when are you coming back? So I started to think about how we could possibly provide a trash service for them. And one of the problems I was seeing is that the homeless don't have anywhere to, to put their trash. Typically, even our small town, we don't even have enough trash cans on Main Street for our, our regular people and tourists to, to use. And most of the dumpsters in town have locks on them. So I was thinking, why not try to provide them with a regular trash service? So in, in, uh, in our little town, we have a day at the Vets Hall called Vets Connect. It's a clean day. And it's sponsored by Vets Connect. They come out and they provide a, a day that the homeless can come into and have showers collect uh, services from other agencies like information on housing, medical, and get food and a, and a lunch. And we decided that maybe that'd be a good place to start engaging them about the trash on the river, and maybe have a day for them to pick up trash. We also started to uh, uh, feed the homeless at the winter shelter, another opportunity just to get to know them and engage them about keeping clean camp and, and uh, providing uh, a place for them to, to bring in their trash for us. Guerneville is a small town of a population of about 3,000 uh, people. We're in an unincorporated area of Sonoma County. And as the crow flies, we're about 10 miles from the ocean. 
We have a homeless population of about 200 people. Since April of 2016, we've had 14 homeless deaths and an, uh, with an average age of 55 uh, years old. And I'm 53 years old and most of the people that I've seen known that have passed away, they look a lot older than, than 55. Um, so leaving trash bags and um, uh, putting them out, we started to uh, engage them at the Vets Connect and the homeless shelter here. We leave them information on, just real simple information about it, keeping a clean camp, just a safe camp, you know, packing it in, packing it out. You know, we just basically talked to them about helping us take care of the river and uh, keeping it clean and we're just letting them know that if they keep a clean camp, people are le less likely to be mad at them. And this is what people are angry about, that they, when they walk or see their camps from along the river and they see this big mess, that this is what they're kind of angry about. So, and this brings less attention to them. Uh, I remember uh, seeing this one guy from the, uh, I was driving along the highway and I could see this camp from real far away. So I parked and walked into this guy's camp and I, he had a huge blue tarp, you know, put up to, to protect his camp and stuff like that. And I go, I go, man, this is not how people camp. And his first response was, I've never been camping before. And this guy had just lost his house like two months before that. So it was uh, kind of interesting. Another story I have is just, um, going through a, a camp one time and approaching a tent and asking them if anybody was there and this lady's head popped out of the tent and she goes, are you Chris Brocate? And I said, yes. She goes, I follow you on Facebook. You're the trash angel. And so we're just started getting out amongst the homeless community about what we were doing. And um, so I just getting to know them, knowing them too, like most of these people are from our community and a lot of them are uh, over 55 or 60 years old. So since 2016, they have put out over 120,000 pounds of trash for us to pick up on Thursdays. Last year, they put out over 45,000 pounds of material for us just on Thursdays. Uh, cleaning the river is catching on with them. Um, we get uh, homeless uh, people in our community come up to me all the time asking for bags, saying that they know about other places that aren't even theirs, that so-and-so got arrested or so-and-so left town and they just left behind a big mess. Can I get some bags? And then we'll set up a time to go by like a week later. And sure enough, last week I picked up 1,040 pounds in 30 minutes that was staged by one of our homeless people in our community that's also a Purple Heart vet from one of the Middle East wars. After, after uh, sometimes people are spending some time cleaning up their camps, they'll invite me into their camp and ask me how they're doing and to see if there's anything else they can do to help clean up, the, uh, clean up their mess. They also give me intel about different places that need uh, cleaning up that we're unaware about because it does take time to, and, and a lot of footwork to go out and identify these trash hotspots and, and places that are being left behind. So word's getting out and our, our project has been spreading up river. We now collect uh, trash, not only in our community, but approximately 90 miles up river uh, in Cloverdale and Healdsburg, we have uh, homeless people staging trash for us in three different locations along our river now. And we've got a couple of people in the community have seen what we've been doing on Facebook and call me up and want to do exactly what we're doing. So last year I got asked to go uh, down to Riverside to speak to the uh, Riverside River Keepers, Water Keeper Group. And it's taken them some time to get some funding and get the project in, in going, but they're actually going to be modeling a similar project like ours, uh, modeled after Clean River Alliance down in Riverside starting next month. So we also work with our local homeless agencies in our community. We have healthcare agency and we have a community service uh, group that uh, work with the homeless and, and we actually um, work with their homeless outreach nurse when 
because we know a lot of them, and we might approach somebody that we're dealing with trash and find out that they're not feeling good, and we can actually refer them to our homeless outreach nurse. And so just developing those types of relationships with uh, homeless agencies and outreach uh, teams and stuff like that in your community really works out really well. A couple more pictures. This is uh, one of the town cleanups we do. We used to have many homeless come out and join us on our town cleanup and then feed the homeless. A couple of pictures of some of this trash that's just staged for us. We have these large orange bags and dump receipt from the dump. And this is what it used to look like when homeless have homeless encampments. You typically see an area where they're all trying to stage their trash and it gets to be accumulated like that. And this is another time where we just left them bags and came back and they had bagged up the trash for us. Here's an example of a clean camp. This guy, Chuck, got to know him very well. He's actually one of the uh, success story. He got uh, uh, connected through Vets Connect and is currently in housing in Santa Rosa, but he was living in a camp that uh, we uh, encouraged them to uh, create a clean camp, try to get, uh, build a community, and they actually created this common kitchen that they would all use because part of the issue is, is they all want to have their own tent, living area, kitchen, and so if we can get an area where there's multiple people living in, in, in a certain area, an acre or something like that, we can encourage them to uh, possibly share a kitchen. That's what they wound up doing in this, this spot. Couple of, couple of shots of, uh, you know, that's what you want to see is a, a tent, lots of space around it. And if you can't read the yellow uh, sign on the tree, it says, please be kind and put your cigarette butts in the ash can, not on the ground. And I literally, there is over 20 people living in this encampment. And you could not find a cigarette butt on the ground, not anywhere. Another example of a, you know, clean camp. Another not example of a clean camp. And this is uh, one of the problems that we face with uh, camps and people who are being either arrested or evicted from a camp and there's no, um, uh, there's nobody to clean up the camp or no notification that they've uh, been uh, moved along. So not only moving them along is not only bad for the environment, it's bad on them too because the stress it creates on, on them having to re relocate or lose all their stuff, but it's also very damaging on the environment because this person will go even deeper into the woods and somewhere else and create another impact in another, another mess and be less likely to engage, you know, our, our services, which are very basic services, but then they also lose touch with maybe uh, outreach and, and health uh, service agencies that have been engaging them as well. <clears throat> so we're also trying to work with our local law enforcement and um, create a dialogue where there, if there is going to be a consequence, that they can possibly come back and do community service time cleaning up the river and working with us. Another situation, you can see where the river's rising right behind us. Within eight hours, approximately, overnight, the river would, rose and would have swept all this stuff down into the river. And this was a situation where somebody was arrested and we kind of monitored the situation to make sure that you know, they weren't going to come back, and if there was any, nobody else going to clean it up, it wasn't. It was going to go in the river. A little after shot there. We used to hold uh, public cleanup events, uh, working with the homeless, but we found out that it actually brought out a little too many personalities, both on the right and left side of of, of uh, the equation, and um, people were angry, like kind of like I was when I first started doing this. I was angry when I saw all this trash. But when I started to get to know them, it was more complex than that. It wasn't just about them leaving the trash behind. They really didn't want to. Most of them want to live in a clean environment and really care about it. If they're living out on the, you know, the, especially out where we do, they're kind of outdoor people. So people are really angry about like why they were there, whose property it was, why are they letting them stay there? So it got to be very complex, but 
we don't have to hold any of those public cleanup events anymore because the homeless are actually helping us so much in creating these clean camps. We've seen a dramatic decrease in the amounts of trash that we find on our local beaches. We have people who have been doing surveys and beach cleanups in our area for 20 years, and they've actually seen, can testify to the dramatic decrease in the amount of trash that we see after our river rises and floods during the winter. So providing trash service, porta potties, is not enabling them. It's taking care of our river and giving people dignity. There needs to be more managed places other than temporary shelters. There needs to be year-round shelters combined with winter shelters and outdoor camps. One of the reasons the homeless don't want to go into shelters is, and I just learned this last winter when our winter shelter was opening up and we were helping some people move out of their camps and move into the winter shelter. And I asked this one lady, I says, are you going to the winter shelter? And she says, no. And I says, well, why not? She says, because when I go there, I feel homeless. I don't feel homeless if I have my place and I still have my stuff. Because most of the time when they go into a shelter, they lose all their stuff. They're not allowed to take all their stuff, but maybe what's in a, in a Rubbermaid container, a couple of Rubbermaid containers full of stuff. So whatever they're holding on to is their home. So I was kind of, that was an eye opener for me. So a couple of things that we've learned and what's working for us. We uh, communicate and partner with other local ho homeless service providers, outreach teams, and we enroll the campers to help us clean up the river provide clean camp education materials at shelters and other homeless service centers, and providing bags ahead of any of the cleanups, gloves, et cetera. Working in teams of two really makes a difference, male and female. Hate to say it really works the best. Having both sexes out there really makes a difference when you're encountering females women or men or families. Um, you know, we treat everything that we do and learn from the homeless as uh, the same way that, and use the same protocols as health agencies. You know, we try not to identify people or, or discuss what we've learned or what they're discussing with us with outside of, of that group. So creating clean camps, service like trash and porta potties and visits by homeless nurses really works and be consistent and keep your word. I can remember one time not showing up on time or the day I told somebody to show up and it took me a little while to gain their trust again. He was really kind of like, hey man, I waited around for you all day, you know? And it may not sound like a lot to, to the average person. Most people think, oh, well, the homeless, they got all the time in the world, but you know, not really. The guy really had something that you know, he could have been doing, like going and getting a shower that day. You know, maybe it's the one time they can go into town and get food and stuff like that. So. And you gotta be really careful about it. And, then, and they don't forget. I'm always surprised about how much they remember and how much they hold you to when you tell them you're gonna be doing something. Here's one of our favorite homeless characters in town. I shouldn't say characters, but he's an awesome guy. We call him Tim the Butt Kicker. And he goes around and all he does, he just likes to pick up cigarette butts. I mean, we live like literally yards away from Russian River and these little tributaries that feed right into it. So. Anything in our streets goes right to our river. So it's, it's amazing what this guy does. We're proud to have him wear one of our shirts, give him a picker. Like Tim, I'm finding that most people that live in our area are from our area. I know people that lost their homes in the 1996 flood that are still living out. They just never recovered. Maybe they, they just couldn't afford that to replace that home they lost even back in 1996 and with Housing prices the way they are, it's really gotten expensive. So one more final note on this, and I just want to say that this morning I was out, I was out on the, uh, I took a hike out to the confluence of the American River, Sacramento River. I noticed many homeless encampments and a lot of trash along the way. And I know and I'm encouraged that using what we've done on the lower river as, a, as much as we've been able to do it, I know this can be done other places. So 
I want to thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, we can talk trash. So there are two questions online at the moment. Uh, the first one is, where do you take the trash? We take it to our local transfer station, which is, uh, luckily enough, we have a local transfer station that's with, within about 10 or 15 minutes from the lower river, which we do a lot of our work in. And uh, do you think that, uh, this is from the Bay Area, do you think this approach uh, would work in an urban environment? Absolutely. I, you know, I. It, you'd be pretty amazed just walking into camps. This is kind of like my experience. Hello, hello. Hey, uh, we want to leave you guys some trash bags and come back next week and pick it up. And it's like, really? Oh, okay, yeah, we'll do that. So, yeah, I think just about anywhere, given the opportunity and the trash bags, and it's something for them to do. They, they take care of their own spot. And then they go, you know, like, give me some more bags. I'll go take care of that other spot. It's pretty amazing. Thanks. I have several questions because I do this here on the American River. So how do you deal with, I mean, you mentioned porta potties And how do you deal with the lack of sanitation out there? And then are you able to put porta potties out there? Who pays for them? And how do you get like approval or who owns the land that you put them on? Well, we've only, could have one place as an example for that. Last year we had a place we were calling uh, summer camp. We had over, uh, we had approximately between a dozen and 20 people living there. And somebody from our community actually donated a porta potty and we just put it within walking distance of the camp. Nobody messed with it. We had just about everybody in the camp using it. I mean, I don't want to have to tell you what people are doing without porta potties. I mean, I think we all know that, yeah. you know. So, who owns the land that these people are camping on? There, like here at the American River, you know, it's the county. It's a big parkway, so the county owns the land. But is is it individual homeowners that own your land out there? Well, uh, this particular spot was county-owned piece of property, and so it wasn't a. a there were no signage or anything else like that to keep people out at the moment. So people were been historically staying there for decades. I mean, we used to go, I used to go in there annually and clean up stuff. It was almost like an archaeological dig. You would see stuff, you know, buried under the sediments from previous floods and stuff. And then um, I guess my last question, I think, for right now, is do you have any sort of like special training you give your volunteers? as far as engagement with the homeless people, and then also as far as safety, you know, how many needles, we're, we're picking up buckets of needles, you know, out there. Is that an well, issue with you guys? Well, fortunately, we're not picking up bu buckets of needles. We do pick up needles occasionally, and we do have uh, spots where we find more uh, than other places. We have containers for them. Yeah, we do. You know, we're very cautious, we're very safe about uh, talking to our volunteers and educating them about being safe and stuff like that. And mostly, like I said, we've really down to a small team of people that we're working with that, that work on this homeless project, because most of the homeless are actually cleaning up for us. I mean, it's just a matter of really, and we're, we've got new literature that actually explains to them, like, please keep these things separate, too, so as we've evolved and, and learned and stuff like that. We've been trying to create these other protocols and put them in place. I yeah, just, you know, we've had the experience where you get a dumpster out there and put the trash in it, and then the next day the dumpster is empty. <laughs> it's all back out again. So, you know, it's yeah. tough. I think the education, like you say, is, is so important in getting, you know, the buy-in from the, the homeless folks. I have a few more online. Um, do you do any uh, sorting of recyclables? We do try to divert as much as possible, but sometimes when we're faced with the ma some of the masses that we have uh, starting out doing what we've been doing, our concentration is mostly on removing the trash. And um, as time has uh, gone along, we've been diverting more as we find more time and have more volunteers. 
One of the problems I've seen on the lower river, and I know this is a, maybe a statewide issue too, is we used to have a recycling center in town. And when that recycling center went away, we just saw like all of a sudden this huge increase in the amounts of cans and bottles of plastics and stuff like that that they just weren't even, didn't even care about recycling anymore. Uh, thank you. And um, so maybe we can post these online or, or send out an email, but uh, maybe you can speak to it for a moment. Are there any training resources that you have developed uh, for this program, uh, such as a methodology for engaging with the homeless, and could that be shared? Well, that's why we're here today is to share what we've learned. And uh, we do uh, have some things that we're going to be posting or putting out in literature form. But right now, it's just a matter of uh, trying to get the word out through uh, speaking at engagements like this. Um, two more. Uh, how many volunteers are in your core group? And uh, what kind of support do you get from the county? So gosh, our core group, the Garbage Patch Kids. Um, uh, 25 to 30, you know, and they're all spread out. We've got a couple of core volunteers and groups happening up in Cloverdale, Hopland area, same thing in Hillsburg. We have a group in Santa Rosa that's created creek cleanups twice a month, and we have the Lower River group. So within three years, you know, we've kind of spread out, but uh, I'd say our core group is between 25 and 30, and just it's taken time, but like I said, the first three years we were um, just about 100% volunteered uh, based group, but just recently we required enough funding for me to go to work full time in January through the county mostly. Thank you. For the porta potties, what are the logistics in terms of who do you kind of coordinate with to haul off and empty? Is it with the county or do you pay for it yourself? Well, like I said, we had a, uh, somebody within the community uh, donate the money and the cost and actually did the logistics behind just calling the porta potty service. And as long as they had a flat location to drop one off, they seemed to be, you know, okay with dropping a porta potty off as long as they had somebody to sign for it. And then we had it picked up towards the rainy season. So it was a seasonal thing too as well. Uh, one thing first in response to the question about is, is the methodology something we can share? Uh, as Chris said, they're working on um, some written materials, but if there's other stuff, just like some of the stuff in this presentation of lessons learned and best management practices, and even maybe the methodology, California Coast Keeper Alliance can work with Russian River Keeper to develop that. If, if State Water Board or anyone's interested in, in sharing those type of work products, we can do that. Um, the question I had for you, Chris, is, and you can relate this either to your own experience but, or, or to ex the experience of expanding it to other areas, but what would you say is the number one barrier either that you've already overcome to get to where you're at now or what is a barrier you see other communities throughout the state um, needing to overcome to be able to implement something like this? Oh boy, I guess it's just, uh, I mean, we did this, you know, the first three years we did this as all, all volunteer based group. There's no reason you can't kickstart, you know, a community active group in your area, just to start cleaning up some of the beaches and along the riverbanks and stuff like that. And that, you know, you're gonna encounter homeless people because that's where they like to hang out. And it's just a matter of saying, hey, you know, we're gonna come by here in a couple of days. You know, if we left you a couple of bags, you see a camp. And it really got it almost got starts grassroots. It's funding too. I mean, they're, you know, to be able to supply your volunteers with gas helps. So we've been able to do that. I'm I'm paid staff right now. We have some, two other part time people that are working, helping me develop this and create a better program out of it. But we're also uh, we've got other volunteers up in the uh, upper reaches of the river that we're actually trying to support with at least dump fees and gas reimbursements. So as funding gets to be uh, more available to us and we develop the program to where we can find more people that, that are willing to go out and do what we're doing. It's, it's mostly in here too. It's, you got to have the heart and patience, you know, with them because there's m multiple reasons why somebody's homeless. You can't judge a book by its cover. I guess one more follow-up question. 
we, we you talked about the bags and the porta potties and also just some of the shelter and education help. Is there something that you think they need that maybe you haven't been able to provide them yet? Or or do you think the program you kind of outlined here is a is a pretty comprehensive program for, for what they need to be able to take, kind of be self-sufficient? I think what we're doing is that the very basic needs, providing trash service and, and maybe a, a place uh, we've been able to identify where there's multiple people leaving. I mean, places where multiple people can live are becoming far and few between. So, I mean, ultimately I think we need organized outdoor camps, especially for people who are not prepared to go into a shelter right away. I mean, there's not housing. So, I mean, people would rather skip the shelter and go right into housing because losing their stuff and going into a shelter makes people feel homeless. I mean, that, that's, you know, bottom line. So, for that one, um, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah. Um, on line again, uh, where is the funding for the garbage disposal coming from? Could you speak to that again? And then also, um, where uh, else in California is this being tried? I believe you said Riverside? It's also being uh, um, created in Riverside County with the Riverside uh, Waterkeepers group. Yeah, uh, Inland Part Empire, this. Inland Empire Waterkeeper. Sorry, yeah, Inland Empire. Um, I, I don't know the full context, but I know that there was somewhat of a crisis because they were just evicting everyone from the river and they was starting to get some publicity of some bad publicity. Um, and so Inland Empire Waterkeeper, I, I believe, reached out to Chris um, to coordinate on coming up with a, a, a better program that had these social components in it. Chris, do you want to speak to the other piece though of? Oh, and can you speak more again about the funding for the disposal itself? Um, are you, maybe where you're contracting with or where you're dropping it off or where that comes from? Well, right now we have a uh, local transfer station. It's a place where we can uh, bring in the garbage and they transfer it over to a bigger landfill in Petaluma. But we've been able to get at least, um, in the beginning, you know, um, some funding. We get a, a nonprofit discount at the, uh, the dump, but we've been able to get uh, funding through our, our local county agencies, water agencies and stuff like that to cover dump fees. I mean, we, you know, that's, in the beginning we may have paid for some of the dump fees, but it was soon after that we started to get some support and some funding for that. That was the very, you know, start of some of the funding. Excellent, thank you. Have you ever collected how much the dump fees have come to? Like how much you pay a year, for example? Actually, yeah, last year, so that was, I was kind of curious. Last year we uh, spent, I think it was around $18,000 in dump fees. And that was with a pretty sizable nonprofit discount. Question over here. Um, have you done, I guess, any effort to try to document, I guess, what the common sources of the trash is to kind of go back to see if there's any way to address where they're getting stuff from? I mean, is a lot of this, like, the stuff being passed out for food? Is this, uh, or is this trash picking? Is there any way to kind of address the source? Actually, that's a great question. Um, Unfortunately, we have our transfer station uh, doesn't have a lot of high security. So I know for a fact that a, uh, there's a certain portion of our homeless community that are going to up to our transfer station, maybe even every night to retrieve stuff. So yeah, that's a great question. That's a huge uh, source problem for us in the lower river is the proximity of a transfer station and the lack of security there. I know this also happens up in Healdsburg and um, I know it's a challenge to secure some of these places, but it's definitely a huge source. Uh, the other problem I see in waste is they do get a lot of uh, clothing options. They have a lot of, uh, I don't want to say maybe even a lot, but they have a few places where they have options to come in and get clothing, but they have very few places to go do their laundry. In our town, I know that the homeless are not particularly welcome in our laundromat because other people don't want to do their laundry after them. Unfortunately, that's sad case. And we're a small town, we only have one laundromat. So where are they gonna go do their clothes? And why go do your clothes when nobody wants you to and you have an opportunity to go get more. So you know, 
you can't have any, uh, uh, like a clothes exchange program because you can't deny anybody clothes for not bringing in their dirties either. People need clothes. So we're trying to figure that one out, but it's a huge, I would say it's a huge problem. The amounts of trash, clothing, textiles, tents, and sleeping bags that we see go, it's, 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 it's really sad. There's got to be a way that we can help them keep their stuff clean too. Wondering how you deal with, like when you come across obvious um, criminal activity, do you deal with law enforcement and does that affect, you know, the trust that you've developed with the other homeless campers when you come, like, you know, stolen mail or what I see is mail or, or stripping wire and things like that? I don't, I don't know. Are you, how do you prove any of that? And honestly, that's, uh, that's, one of those um, slippery slopes that we deal with every once in a while. You can't judge a book by its cover. I thought for sure this one guy we were dealing with was stealing, like where is he getting all this stuff and how does he have a $3,000 bike in his camp? But sure enough, this guy is not a thief and he's not wanted by the police and this stuff wasn't stolen. And they got ways of getting this stuff. People put stuff out for free in front of their properties all the time. And they go dumpster diving. And they put bikes together. That's a big deal out there is transportation. They, they, they know how to put and take, take apart bikes. And if they're finding a lot of this stuff at the transfer stations, that's another big source for them. But I've honestly, I've never called the sheriffs on anybody. And I've been, it's so frustrating and close sometimes. I've got somebody I've called Fish and Game on because I just don't know what to do with somebody I've been trying to get to clean up their camp for three years. And we've cleaned up literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds from this, this one person. But make little head waves. Now I, now I leave my dump trailer for him every once in a while and he fills it up for me. You know, I make a deal with him. I go, look, if I drop my trailer off here and I just let you Load everything yourself. Well, you do that, and I'll come back in three hours. And sure enough, I come back in three hours. He's got 1,000 pounds in the back of my truck. So, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge sometimes, but, you know, I don't know. Moving them along, it comes down to that, what I've learned about, you know, displacing them or moving them along. and make It's only more difficult in the future to engage them, and, and you lose that. Yeah, you lose that connection you've had with them too if they do that. Uh, a source control um, question online. Uh, have you thought or uh, tried providing the homeless with reusable supplies or items to help reduce the amount of trash that they generate? That's a good question. Um, you know, we, going back to the one guy that had never been camping before, yeah, it's a challenge for some of them who've never been camping before. So just, you know, educating them a little bit about, you know, this is not how people camp. And if you guys could downsize your situation, create a common kitchen that you guys can all use so that you're not creating a, another kitchen and another mess. Um, yeah, you get blamed for enabling people too if you teach them too much. So that's, that's the other thing, you know. Well, that's all the questions uh, online and I think in the room. So, um, Chris, thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and thank you all in the room for coming and online. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. It's been my honor.